It's now common to hear that slavery was America's original sin. After all, chattel slavery was a moral abomination and a direct contradiction to the supposed founding principles of the United States. In recent years, some historians and commentators have also claimed that the enormous wealth generated by Southern slavery fueled the entire U.S. economy, meaning that the economic might of the antebellum North would not have been possible without slavery. If this is indeed the case, it means we can trace much of America's economic structure and strength, even today, all the way back to the horrific institution of slavery. But while slavery undoubtedly did affect America's economic and political development during the 19th century, the idea that American capitalism was founded on slavery doesn't hold water. A central claim of the New York Times celebrated 1619 project is that slavery helped turn a poor fledgling nation into a financial colossus and that the entire country, not just the South, was economically dependent on slavery and the cotton trade. But in the journal Catalyst, historian James Oakes argues that this view distorts the relationship between slavery and capitalism. It's a strange kind of argument to make. There's a lot of industrialization going on in the North. The economic historians who studied the Industrial Revolution, and even sometimes the social historians, have dismissed the idea that we should be focusing very heavily on the cotton trade. Cotton production did not translate to a wide-scale economic boom across the nation. In fact, although cotton was the country's main export, in total it accounted for less than 5% of the nation's GDP prior to the Civil War. While northern textile mills and plenty of other businesses certainly had ties to the slave economy of the South, northern economic growth was driven primarily by industrial developments within the North. In the North, the Industrial Revolution was much more broadly based. It was local, it was Panama hats in towns in Western Connecticut, it was clocks, it was pots and pans, it was books, it was, there was a lot of industrialization going on in the North. What's more is that the U.S. economy saw its most dynamic expansion only after slavery ended. The slavery needed capitalism far more than capitalism needed slavery. If we're going to say that the entire wealth of the North is grounded in slavery, then the logical inference would be that the destruction of slavery during the Civil War would lead to a catastrophic economic decline of the Northern economy. But we know that didn't happen. We know exactly the opposite happened. It was the period of the North economy's greatest economic development. And there's another problem with the claim that Southern slavery fueled Northern prosperity. It suggests that Northerners had something to gain from the slave trade. But the wealth that was generated through slavery bypassed not only most Northerners, but also most Southerners. To confuse the accumulation of wealth by a ruling class with general economic health and well-being is a serious, serious economic and political mistake. On the eve of the Civil War, slave ownership and all the money that this entailed was concentrated in fewer and fewer hands while the number of landless poor whites in the South was increasing significantly. In other words, the suggestion that all free Americans stood to benefit even indirectly from slavery is really just trickle-down economics by another name. And the assertion that we need only look to the antebellum plantation system to grasp the massive economic inequality we face today obscures some of the fundamental dynamics of our contemporary economy. If you're just gonna say everything is the legacy of slavery, you're never really going to come to terms with the grotesque inequality that has emerged in the last 40 or 50 years in the United States. The way capitalism produces those kinds of inequities almost in automatically if they're not held in check and the way those inequalities systematically undermine democracy. We've all sat and watched the emergence of these super wealthy Americans in the last generation or two who have been liberated from the tax structures that existed through the middle of the 1900s and have accumulated grotesque amounts of wealth. And at the same time, wages have stagnated, jobs have gone overseas. You can't say that this massive accumulation of wealth by these grandees today any more than the massive accumulation of wealth by slaveholders is an indication of a robust economic development that benefited all white people. As the historian Matt Karp has written, a more creative historical politics would move in the opposite direction, recognizing that the power of American capitalism does not reside in a genetic code written 400 years ago. 
But slavery, as we know, was a monstrous institution that remained legal for nearly a century after the nation's founding. So how exactly should we understand its legacy? According to James Oakes, we should look to the legacy of emancipation. It's the destruction of slavery that has far more continuing significance for the way we live and the way African Americans have lived than any continuing influence of slavery. I would shift the question to what did emancipation achieve and what did it fail to achieve? What still had to be done? For the Record is a Jacobin Channel miniseries dedicated to debunking historical myths and distortions through conversations with scholars on the left. If you like this video, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.